Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Recovery and Resiliency Principles and Practices Training with Mary Jedwisiak. This is a live training that was filmed on May 26, 2010 in Vancouver, Washington. If you'd like information about other trainings and services offered by Mary Jedwisiak, please visit our website at www.matac.net. This is a four-module training and you are watching Module 4. We wrap up our coverage of the components of recovery and resiliency, and then we revisit Jim through small and large group discussions. We discuss who recovers from what and how. The training ends with a large group discussion about incorporating these principles and practices into our daily lives. So one of the things that I really think is probably one of the most powerful new developments, and I, I kind of shrug when I say new because, you know, it's new, it really isn't. <laughs> but what's happened with peer support is that it's becoming formalized and it's Medicaid reimbursable. That's a good thing, right? It's a very good thing. So what's happened with peer support is that where you have people who've experienced mental illness helping other people who are experiencing mental illness get well. That may be in the form of jobs, that may be in the form of parenting, it may be in the form of house cleaning, or not, not that you hire a peer to clean your house, but that they help you learn how to do it yourself. So peer support is really powerful for exactly what you would expect, which is experiential knowledge. Like I can go to the psychiatrist because he's a really good chemist. And I don't know why I always say he for psychiatrist because I've always had women psychiatrists. Um, and that's why I'm so well today. <laughs> so, um, peer support. Oh, so you go to a psychiatrist or a, uh, a clinician for the technical knowledge that they have and the tools that they can teach you, right? Like this, you know, particular, this particular uh, psychiatrist is really good at this particular illness and helping to manage it with medicines. They really understand the whole chemistry involved in both the illness and in the, the, the medicine. Uh, this particular therapist is really good coaching people in DBT groups and they're really helpful in that or whatever it is we go to clinicians for, right? But the thing about peers is that they're really good at spotting our uh, BS, <laughs> right? They're really good at calling us on our stuff and being like, well, you can live in filth if you want to, but then, you know, CPS might step in. So they're just a really good at helping us to see that maybe we are just kind of sitting back and playing a victim. Or maybe we are really taking advantage of the fact that we have an illness and it's just too hard. And sometimes it is really hard. And sometimes that experiential language is just to say, you're right. It really is hard. And if you want to spend the afternoon curled up in a ball, I'll buy you the blanket. And then I'm coming back tonight, and you're going to take a shower, and we're going to snap out of it. So that whole peer support that really understands where you are, but more importantly, understands the potential of where you can go and how to get there. That more importantly than where you are is, is is the power of where you've been. Because they can look at where you've been and match it to where they've been or not and be able to kind of help you chart a path for the future. And to be able to help you to navigate the system is a huge role that peer support specialists have. Where they can say, oh no, no, that's not how you say it, <laughs> right? Here are the magic words that you need to get whatever it is that you need to get. Because let's face it, sometimes there are magic words that open doors in any system, in every system. And if you're new to the Medicaid mental health care system, holy smokes, you need, you need, a, you, you need not only the helmet with the light on the front of it, but you need a pickaxe too, right? <laughs> and you need a canary. <laughs> so, I mean, we need, sometimes you, and, and here's the other thing that I find really fascinating is, um, as I was growing up, uh, as I was raising my son and dealing with my own issues, I became really good at managing chaos. So to me, it wasn't a crisis. This was just life, 
right? It's just how it is. But somebody else can come in and look around and go, oh yeah, honey, you need some help here, right? This is officially a crisis. And so they can help you to identify that without being judgmental, without being like, you are a complete failure and you know, get thee to the therapist. That's not what it was about. It's about coming in and, and again, seeing the strengths, building on what you do well, and then modeling how to move forward. And that's such a powerful thing to not only realize that you can do it yourself, but to see that somebody else actually did it and maybe they were worse off than you. And they can tell you a story that is worse than yours and you'd be like, wow, if she can do it, I can do it. If she can get off her pity pot and put on her big girl shoes and go to work, there's no reason why I can't. The other thing is that sometimes we don't get what we want and we get really angry because we, we um, sometimes tend to see things through the, the lens of, of, of victimizing experiences because we've had some pretty significant traumatic victimizing experiences, whether that be uh, actual, where we were actually victimized or where we perceived that or where the symptoms were really so bad that it was traumatic. So you tend to see, you, you get a little gun shy and you get a little caustic and bitter. That's what happens to me. It's that caustic and bitter. You can give me a situation that looks really good and I will find the caustic, bitter, bad intentions behind it, right? Like, well, look, they're gonna pay you $5,000. Well, it's probably worth 20, you know? <laughs> so that's when I know things aren't going too well for me. But what a peer can do is give you an alternate interpretation for that and say, you know, I think maybe you might be looking at this wrong, that they're not denying you services. They're just, it, the services that you want don't exist. So they're giving you the next best thing. But they're not kicking you out of the system and denying you services. And that's just an example of how a peer support specialist can reframe things for you and really help you have an alternative interpretation to what's going on, good and bad. Because the other piece is, is that we are beating ourselves up horribly, right? I am just a complete basket case and the only thing I ever did right was by accident. And someone can come along and be like, oh, are you kidding me? Look at your life, look at what you've done. And they can enumerate the things that have happened that you created, that you started, that are there because of you, that you don't see. So peer supports can help us readjust our distorted thinking in a lot of ways. One of the best ways is when you walk in for help in that mental health system, you walk in that front door and you're trying to invoke your inner warrior and you see a colleague and you see that um, a peer support specialist is there working with you. But the piece that I wanna look at is um, when you're working next to a peer support specialist and um, I'll tell you a little story. There was a woman who got a job at the local mental health agency after having been, um, after having visited there for various other reasons over the course of years and, um, and she got a job there and she was meeting with clients and she went up to the receptionist and said, you know, I need to use the phone for a second and the receptionist said, the client phone is over there and she said, I know but I work here now she holds up her badge. I work here now and I need to use this phone because I've got this person with me and we've got some stuff to do. And the receptionist said, the client phone is over there. So what happens to a lot of people when they go to work in the mental health system is they don't realize that they're creating culture change. They don't realize that they're becoming change agents within the building. They just think they're getting a paycheck. Right? So all of a sudden, a uh, therapist walks in and she wants to have her lunch and she looks and there's like a former client sitting in the break room. It's a little hard to adjust to. It's a little hard to digest. It's kind of challenging. And Terry's laughing. Because like. I'm that person. You know? I work there now and I've been there yes. it's, it's, it's a really It's really difficult for the person coming into the situation if they don't know that this could be difficult, and it's really difficult for the clients. So again, this is where management comes in. 
This is where it's not just ground level stuff. It has to be systemic stuff. We as a community embrace peer support. We as a community are going to do this. We as executive directors, this is what we need to do. I was doing a workshop on employment at a, an employment conference and I was describing this phenomenon. An executive director came up to me horrified and said, that never happens at my agency. And like I knew people that worked at his agency. <laughs> and it was out of town. It wasn't anything here in Clark County, but it was out of town and I'm like, why don't you go back and ask your peer support specialist if this is true for them? Because I, I can't speak for everybody. And so that's just one of those things that happens. That's that culture shift. And so when you think about who's in the break room with you. But it can be really powerful because you can get an also an alternative explanation as well. An alternative interpretation. Because if you think that your client is just malingering, I love that word, it just rolls off the tongue, malingering. Um, <laughs> The peer support specialist may be like, well, it's May. You know, she was assaulted a year ago in May. Maybe that's what's happening. You know, she told me this. You didn't know this. It's not in the record anywhere, but she shared with me that, you know, typically the spring's a bad time for her. So there are some things that, that you know, that it goes both ways. That alternate interpretation goes both ways. Where you can kind of get a view into the cultural world of people with mental illness and the people with mental illness get a view into the cultural world of mental health services. Rose. It's, it's uh, not that new of a concept since we used to call it grassroots. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did used to call it grassroots. And pretty much everything I'm talking about today we called it something else at some other time. I mean, it's so funny for me. The, the, the longer you stick around this system, the more things come back in vogue. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Um, and this is some things that you can just kind of think about is how can a peer support specialist help you get well, but also how can a peer support specialist help me do my job? When you're going through your day, um, it, it's, it's you know more than just filing is what I like to think of it. We often think, well, yeah, she, well, I do need some help catching up on my paperwork. Yeah, that's not what they're there for. <laughs> they really do that one-on-one -on -one support with people, and they really do provide that experiential learning and that experiential knowledge, and um, kind of fill in the gap in the system, and provide, bring some dignity into the whole experience for the people that are um, accessing the services. So that's the end of the 10 components of recovery as they were defined by the consensus group. Um, but what's the last piece here is on resiliency. I told you earlier that I really thought that the reason that Washington State put resiliency in with these 10 components is because they just did not believe in recovery. That was that caustic and bitter thing that I refer to sometimes when I am looking at a system at large. I always assume evil intentions. Sometimes I'm right. <laughs> but what I realized was I, was I was hired by Nintendo to do, Nintendo America, to do a training for their employees. And uh, they, wanted to, uh, they wanted to do a training on resiliency. It was part of their health support for their staff. So I, so I started looking at resiliency and I realized that it is a critical component to being alive, quite frankly, let alone getting well uh, from any illness, let alone a mental illness or an emotional instability or any kind of psychological trauma or distress. We have to be resilient. Now, when you think of resilience, you think of kind of like a, a rubber band where it comes back, right? You're able to snap back to the way it was. Um, and that's true to some degree, but really what happens when you're resilient is that you kind of just learn new skills with your new shape, right? <laughs> so if you kind of get, you know, you get pushed in over here, you learn how to roll this way a little bit better. And, and if your life becomes a little, um, a little flat on one end, you just kind of learn to roll around that flat spot. We just learn to adjust and adapt to what's going on in our lives. It's a critical component that helps us step away from victimization and that obsessive thinking about what if and that obsessive thinking about um, I want my life back the way I envisioned it when I was 18 before I got sick or I'm so angry at what those people did to me because I'll never be 
the person that maybe I was supposed to be. We can get stuck in that. And that is a really emotional, powerful place to be. And emotional power can be good or bad. So that's the choice that we get to make. Are we going to get stuck in the negative and the rage and the pain? Or are we going to move through that and move into the optimistic thinking and the gratitude and the reframing and the positive that we've learned? Both feel really good, right, for a short period of time. I don't know if you've ever like really been angry for, a, I mean, if it has a power to it. It has a charge to it that you can become addicted to and get stuck in. And sometimes that's also where peer support specialists can point out to you, did you notice that you're really angry? Because like, sometimes we don't even realize we're angry, just to who we are. And we get to choose whether we want to stay in that or whether we want to move into our positive. And that's the resilience piece. When you can acknowledge, I have every right to be angry. I have every right to be sad. I have every right to be stuck in this stuff that's over here. But I'm going to choose to box it up and set it aside. And I'm going to focus on the positive because what we focus on grows. Yes? Um. My mom always told me that you focus on the bad stuff, it drains your energy. Yes. You focus on the positive and it gives you energy. So what her mom said was that if you focus on the bad stuff, it drains your energy. Mm -hmm. You focus on the positive stuff and it provides you with energy. Yes. I like that. I'm, that may end on slide someday. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like that a lot. I, I find that to be true in my life very much. And what's really interesting to me is that when I look back at the stuff that I was so enraged about and so hurt about and so angry about and stuck in, usually I look back at it and, and it's really embarrassing that I was so torqued out over this little thing. Or it was my own distorted thinking that created this thing. So we get to choose. We get to choose. Um, and the thing about resilience is that it, it involves behaviors. It's not just an attitude, it's a behavior. And it's actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. Now, this next slide, it really kind of confused me, right? Revealing, it can't be taught, but it can be learned. I don't get it, I don't get it. Well, I can tell you how to be resilient, but you gotta do it. It's experiential learning. You gotta do it to realize the power that's involved in letting go and choosing to be positive and choosing to really kind of land on your feet. Or, you know, at least like I'm old, I don't land on my feet anymore, I, but I can roll over to the side and get up, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's the choice that we make. We can stay on the ground and cry or we can kind of roll over and get up and keep walking. And um, so that's what resilience is all about. And that's why it's such a critical component. Now, the thing about it is that once you decide to turn away from the negative and you start to embrace the positive and you start to kind of understand, you, you begin to develop meaning for what's going on. You begin to understand that there was a reason why this happened. Now, if I had stayed stuck in it, I never would have seen it for what it is. I never would have seen the falsehood in my perceptions, or I never would have really seen the gift that was in this bad thing that happened to me. As we move on, we have to be really realize that we have the capacity to be made better by life's difficulties. We're born with it. We can choose to walk away from it or to step into it, but we're born with the capacity to be made better by life's difficulties. Now, there's a handout, in your handout, there's an article there from the Mayo Clinic. And, um, and it gives you 10 ways to develop resiliency, to kind of sharpen that skill. And, um, and this is just some of them. But I think that's really, it, I'd like to go through some of them. Being honest and being able to say what you see is such a powerful thing. Just to be able to say what you see. You don't have to make judgments about it, but, just to, but rather than assume that what you're seeing is something or other, but to say what you see and really be as honest as you can is so freeing for everybody around you. You'd be shocked when you start doing it. The assumptions that we make are outrageous. 
Well, but when we can speak the truth about what we're thinking, other people respond and be like, no, that's not it at all. So it really gives us an opportunity to get an accurate read on what's happening. The next one is really like my favorite. I, I just think that everything is funny. <laughs> sometimes that's really inappropriate. <laughs> but sometimes it saves my bacon. Because I think it's funny. You might not think it's funny, but I think it's really funny. And so um, I try not to laugh out loud if you don't think it's funny. I try to just do that in the car on the way home. But that really helps me to stay centered in myself and not to be too pulled in one way or the other by what other people think. But to be able to really recognize who am I and why is, I mean, I think humor is just so, part about humor that I love is that it's so accurate. <laughs> and you can really tell a lot about a person by what they think is funny. You know, there are some jokes that I give through the course of this training and, and I can tell by who laughs is what kind of a, what kind of a crowd I have in the room, you know. Because some people think some stuff is funny, some other people don't. And I, and I just think humor is, one of those things that just helps us to get over ourselves and to let go of some of the seriousness. I've talked a lot about optimism and expecting things to work out well. Um, developing a talent for serendipity, right? To just kind of be like, well, look at this. I wonder what's coming next. This is, this is supposed to be here, right? What's supposed to be with it? And really try to find the serendipitous things that are happening in our world and making those connections. One of the things that's kind of freaky about that is when you start watching it, you really can see some amazing connections that you didn't notice were there before that seem to be coincidental, but may not be. So um, the, uh, the last thing on here, aside from this Mayo Clinic handout was, and the APA handouts, was the, um, the ability to read others with empathy. Now, that does not mean that you agree with them, or that you don't agree with them, or that you need to fix them, or that, uh, that you need to point out to them where areas where they can fix themselves, right? Um, it's just about really understanding where people are and why. And the only reason to do that is so that we can connect with them compassionately. Really, that's the only reason to do that is to be able to bring compassion to the connection and to the conversation so that you can help them feel, I understand it, this is where you are, and how can I help? And the more we do it, the more we get stronger at it. So there's a whole lot more to resilience, and it's a really powerful deal. Um, but what I'd like you to, what I'm hoping that you'll do is that you will take the, um, the test there's a little test in your handouts, uh, like where you can test your own resilience and you can see just how resilient am I. And I think it's always good to know how resilient you are uh, before something bad happens, <laughs> you know. And so it's kind of like writing your will before you get really sick. <laughs> see, some of you laughed. I know a lot about you that laughed at that joke. So, um, there's so, that, so really looking at that, that, that uh, uh, hand out there about resilience, taking the test. But one of the things that I do want to talk about that I think is really important when we talk about resilience is self-care. I said before, people are not in the helping profession because they want to get rich. It's not why it's there. People are there because they feel like they have something that they can bring to the table, something that they can offer other people. And what happens is that when you offer that and you give that, you need to replenish. So what you, what I hope that you will be able to do is to identify a way that you can replenish yourselves regularly and that you make plans to do it. I love bird watching. It's one of those things I just love to do. I'm a total amateur at it and then my car got stolen and you know how when they steal your car they take everything out of it, the thieves do? Well my bag that had my camera and my life list in it got stolen. So. I bought a new camera, but it's nowhere near as good, and my life list is gone, so I'm like, oh, I don't know. I think I've seen this one before. So I've lost a little of the passion, but I still get lost in the process. Whenever I go out to do it, I just get lost in bird watching. Now, I make it easy for, to go bird watching. I travel a lot. And so I have a bag in my car that has a camera, that has a field guide, has the little notebook. I can keep track of what I've seen and where and when. And 
So when I'm driving to Goldendale, um, there are little game, re uh, little wildlife preserves. There are these little signs. They're little signs, but I know I see one. I'm like, Arr! right? I've gotten my car in situations where it should not have been, right? In those, <laughs> and then I realize, oh, I'm not driving a tractor. So I learned how to drive on a tractor, so I have to kind of, I think I can go anywhere in my little Honda and I have to kind of back out slowly. So that's one way that I can spontaneously go do what I love, is I keep what I need to do that in my car. If what you love is rollerblading, keep it in a bag next to your front door. If you, if you, like, to, um, if you like to sing, you know, keep your favorite CDs in your car. Whatever it is, make it easy to take care of yourself. Because if it isn't easy, you aren't going to do it. But the other thing is, we need to plan ahead for self-care. We, I bet right now you guys could all tell me the process that you have to pay your bills. And that is probably one of the most stressful things anybody has to do. But you all have a little, a little routine, right? How you do it, I do it, my bills are all due this day, on the 10th of the, all you, I'm sitting down writing my checks. I've got it all on automatic withdrawal. Whatever it is that your routine is, you have one for it. So my question is, do you have a routine for self-care? You've got the routine all set up for you know, the, the negative stuff. I have a friend, and we drive up to you know, those big old funky tubs with that leak, the big clawfoot bathtubs, and they leak, and then when you're laying in, you look up, and you're like, oh my god. Is the ceiling going to fall in on me? You know, it's great, it's cheap, it's like $15, and if you go during the week, it's two for one. And you can take a hot mineral bath, and they wrap you up in those blankets on those cots that you're not sure if they're going to hold your weight or not. Whoa! So it's just this old, funky experience that's cheap and it's easy. We talk about work all the way up, we talk about family all the way back, and, and it's never intentional, that's just the way it is. Um, we just, it's just one of those things that we do. We, we don't get the, the massage because neither one of us can afford it, but we do just go up there and, and we have a bath and a wrap and come home at least every six weeks. And sometimes our kids will be like, you need a bath, which is very, an odd thing for a kid to say. But what that means is that our kids are aware that we need to, we need to go decompress. So however you choose to decompress, whatever is it that you do that helps you to get back in touch, to replenish your fuel cells, that's what I'm hoping you'll be able to do. Because otherwise, you can't give to people who are really in a lot of pain unless you have some reserves yourself. Because otherwise, you're just kind of there mentally and paperwork-wise, but you're not really there spiritually. And to me, the whole relationship in a caring, giving relationship, in a caregiver, helping relationship, is a spiritual relationship. It's a connection from one human to the other. I need what you have. And I am going to hopefully tap in with you on a spiritual level. And, and we can have an exchange that's really meaningful. So we can't do that if we don't have any reserves. We can't do that if we're just kind of there mentally but not emotionally, if we're not really present with the people that we're there to help. So that's what I'm hoping is that you'll find some self-care stuff that really works for you. Speaking of self-care, Jim's life has really turned around. <laughs> and I know you're going to enjoy reading Jim's new life. So read Jim's life and then we're going to get back in the same small groups we were in before and have another conversation. It seems as if they are communicating with him. They're, you know, respecting his choices. They're listening. Listening is doctor now. <laughs> there's a whole team. Um, there's the doctor, a cognitive behavioral specialist, and then they talk with him. So they are a team. This is a three partners agree, and a peer support specialist. It makes a huge difference because that person is instilling hope in the recovery process that you know, there is recovery now. And it lists the peer support, the um, specialist. He's going, we, it talks about weekly, he continues. It's an ongoing thing and it seems like they assess 
at periodically, so they adjust his medications and they all confer. So it seems like it's working. It's a coordinated effort. They're nurturing his recovery. Well, I'm talking about the pros and cons, and yeah. it didn't seem like that happened before either. Right, right. And they're, they, they exercise patience with him. You know, I mean, they defuse his relapses. They, they work with him. They're, they're involved in, in pursuing his recovery. Well, and the nice thing about that is when, when he does start having problems after they've reduced his medication, they don't say, oh, well, that means we need to go back on the medications. They say, so what can we do differently to help you? Which is it's completely different from because of the skills and the you know it teaches him that he can move forward you know the psychoeducation and, and learning about his his symptoms so that he can learn tools so that he can get off the medication is huge he didn't have that before I think he has to be even when he wants to he has to be convinced of its possibility and 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 so he has to go through the whole process of learning what he can and can't do. Right. Well, I like that they didn't make him feel abnormal because he was experiencing all those things after going on medication. They're like, okay, well, this is kind of a normal part of that, and so there are things that we can do to make it better for you instead of just slapping him, you know, snapping a patch on and saying, you need more meds. Yeah. The support group really, you know, yeah, pure, made a yeah. huge difference, you know. And essentially provided the means for him to essentially attack what he needs to do for, for his life to become whole again. Like social skills, yeah. recognizing that while he was in the midst of his challenges, he, he lost his social skills. He got out of practice. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. and his vocational skills. That's right. Yeah. He's a person this time. <laughs> you know, with, with, with the frustrations, he's still able to continue to grow and to attack those problems that, that, present, that are presented for him. See, because he has the support, he comes back to his team, explains the situation, the non-success, they hear him, they confer, and because they know, because um, they have this recovery model, they understand <laughs> that what he's experiencing is normal, and so then they, so they can continue that support for him, no you're not nuts, no we're not giving up on you and then they, they modify and he continues to go on and then he makes changes. He continues to make changes and adapts. And he for grows success. and he grows Girl. from having to confront the difficulties that he's presented with. Because you know what do we have if we don't have a sense of accomplishment? Mm -hmm. You know, pride in ourselves and so that makes a huge difference. I think because of that, we see the change in Jim for him to continue. And he, even though he thinks all these things are coming back, he goes back, but the team hears him, understands. So he, he doesn't just give up. I love that they put him in a position of authority kind of after that. It's like, not only are you not relapsing so far that we have to put you in a home somewhere, we're going to put you as a model to look toward for this is what we're really hoping for everybody. And what he's, what he's learned is able to essentially put to use. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And also the fact that it is a process. It's that nonlinear growth. Mm -hmm. There's all these components that they all need to be supported. and and. And then at the end, he actually becomes um, a, a self-help trainer. Mm -hmm. So that's even proce a process of his success as he begins to be a trainer so that no, not only can he help, but he's also practicing those skills. Mm -hmm. So um, all that advice was really helpful for him. And the key thing is that they treated him like a person instead of a diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. That seems to And respond to see him. Right, right. So what do you think that needs to happen, you know, for, you know, these things to be happening in our mental health system? You know, I see, um, I see teaching the consumers or people like Jim um, to, to, you know, have educated, you know, informed decisions, teaching them to be empowered, teaching them to communicate differently with their um, providers so that they can, you know, move forward in their recovery. And information, the information about their particular instance, information on um, what the other support people are bringing, and this, they talked about this recovery model, so there must be 
a, a, a actual system of number of people in that. You might know about that, but to bring that recovery model into our countywide system or individual systems, because it, it looks like there's some professionals involved and some peer trainers involved. Sounds like look, by this count, it's successful. Right. Well, we just walk-in in recovery in thing at CVAB that was wonderful. They had a film and showing people that had previously been, you know, mental health patients, you know, and now they're they're on track and everything's okay. I think just bringing a large number of those kind of success stories to the people that need to see them, you know, so that they can say to themselves, that could be me. I don't have to be, you know, tainted anymore. I mean, don't see themselves as, as a person that has no hope whatsoever, just continually bringing them possibilities of what they could be. And also the people that are taking, the clinicians that are watching them, you know, when, when they see that recovery is possible for everybody, well, again, in the, first, in the first scenario, they were very remote. In the second scenario, they were involved in the whole process of his recovery. They were essentially, uh, they diffused his relapses, they essentially intervened in, in positive ways, and as opposed to just wait for him to fail and then <laughs> to punish him. Yeah. Awareness is very important for everybody, and like you say, if they could have those ongoing videos, like in the waiting rooms, or um, just have those out front, yes, say these are the success stories, you know, within your community, you know, it can work. What I've seen work is having peer support in the agency so that the providers can see that recovery is possible because, you know, they see the effects on the consumers, that you know, and they see the the peers, you know, are in recovery, and it makes it. it I think it'll cause a lot of um, <coughs> change. Yes. And the thing with the peers is that um, you, the the person uh, with the issues, can relate. And they see that success. And the peer, too, can be encouraged. I'm helping someone. I'm helping someone through where I have been. And, um, and plus the time, that time factor. They can give more time. It sounds like maybe weekly or every few days they meet, but they keep on track with their people. It would also reduce the us versus them mentality. You know, here's the clinician, here's the patient. Well, a peer is kind of in the middle. And so it. it shortens that gap considerably. It actually can be of advantage to both the, the <laughs> provider and the customer exactly. in regards to uh, uh, how you intervene with the person. Mm -hmm. Sure, because the provider learns from oh, And the provider, too. at the point where the, the peer is essentially confirming what the provider is, is uh, insisting is taking place, right. he, 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 he can be persuasive in convincing the customer that this is my view for his own good, mm -hmm. as opposed to him being an adversarial position. Mm -hmm. And it's also just a, a physical way of seeing, actually this is possible, instead of just being told that recovery is possible, but this is like a person walking in saying, I'm, you know, I'm the living proof that it's really possible, and giving them additional hope. How can we as an entire community support this? Uh, just talk, talking to people, perhaps. I, I don't know. I feel um, out in East County, I, I, I'm not familiar with this system, but I think just talking to my peers in the counseling area um, and being aware of what services there are and the recovery model, I mean, this is awesome. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Providing more resources in the community so that people can become more independent of the mental health system and build those social skills and you know, have opportunities to get jobs, you know, kind of change the stigma in the community so that these people can move forward in their lives, like like Jim obviously is. Well, where there's a job opportunity, you know, they can provide opportunities for growth regardless of whether a actual paying position. Right. They can essentially, uh, they can essentially open some doors for them, and also to other social ways. Just feeling part of the community. Mm -hmm.
a part of the community for sure. Well, remember before they had, um, you know, kids in wheelchairs and Down syndrome and stuff in the schools, it was like nobody ever really saw these people. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was this outrage because everybody was saying, um, we don't want them in our schools with our kids and, you know, it could have horrible consequences. Well, you can see that it didn't. It was it's been a really good thing all the way over. And it's just the same thing. It's, we have to overcome our, our own stigmas, our own biases about the mental health community. And the only way to really do that is to have constant interaction with them and realize they're not that different from us. All right, so you um, revisited Jim. Things are a little bit different in Jim's life, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you had a con and you had an opportunity to read the scenario and then discuss amongst yourself some of the things that were going on in Jim's life and answer the questions that were on the back of the page. So let's start with the first one. Was what were some of the specific ways in which the system supported Jim. They communicated with him. They communicated with him? For the first year. And, and can you say a little bit more about that? Which way, what, how did they communicate? They listened to him. Okay, they, they listened. They listened to him. They, yeah. They respected his choices. Yes, good, they respected his choices. They, he had choices as before, which is before it was just a one-shot deal as we described. It was just that one deal, medicine or no medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, they talked about the pros and cons, and and he made the decisions. He was running the show yes. with their input. Self-directed care, he was running the show with their input. They gave him options, and he was the one who had the final choice. Nice. There was a couple hands over here, here, and then here. I think that they, they took a more holistic approach, and they uh. looked at um, all aspects of his life, his employment, his social life, um, and all of those things. So they really looked at holistically. Rather than just making everything a symptom or connecting it with the illness. So they kind of stepped outside of the medical model and really looked at him as a human. Yes. Nice. It's, I was going to talk on those lines, but it felt like there was a personal connection with him, especially when he went to his relapse. He had the social roadblock that he ran into. Yes. There was a backup plan, but there was definitely a personal connection that helped him. There was the personal connection. They really connected with him on that human level as opposed to the clinical level. And they were present and yeah, thanks. That was, that's a really good point. Um, they provided him with the opportunities to do self-help and coping strategies. And the first one, when he went off his meds, he didn't know what to do or how to deal with it. But mm -hmm. by providing these, you know, once they started to decrease, he could know what to do next. So they provided him with support so that he could then kind of make plans ahead and help himself. Very good. Yes. Nice. One more? As I read this, uh, there was a, a language change. And, ah, okay. Uh, and they kind of got, got out of the relapse, the relapse prevention into a kind of a recovery mode, you know, it's a recovery plan, mm -hmm. but talked more in the positive than in a, in a, in a failure systems language. Yes. So, okay, so there was a change in language that reflected a change in attitude and dare we say maybe even a change in culture in the community where they had a recovery plan <laughs> as opposed to a relapse plan. Yeah, nice, thank you. So what was, some was there changes, in, was there a difference in Jim? What was Jim's difference? What's going on with him inside internally that was different for him? Well, at first when he was talking to his doctor, then um, he, he gave up pretty easily because he could see he wasn't being heard. But oh, um, okay. instead of just um, getting scared and, and not really knowing what to do, he, he knew that he'd be listened to. He knew he'd be supported. And so he was really open about some kind of you know embarrassing maybe things for him about the fears he was having, the problems he was having. Whereas before he may have just said, you know, I don't like I don't like uh, the turn of dyskinesia. But he wasn't really talking about the other step, which was much more intimate and personal. So he was able to get vulnerable with the people that were there to help him because he knew they were listening. Yeah. It wasn't just talking about um, things that you hope that they'll listen to, but really knowing that they're going to listen to you about what's important to you. Mm -hmm. That makes a big really difference. Cool. Yeah. yeah, nice, good point. Um, Jim uh, followed through and continued. Even though he um, was depressed 
and things weren't working, he continued to meet and he continued to follow through. So he didn't give up. Even though he was depressed, he continued to meet with the team and follow through. Even though his symptoms came back, he continued and persevered. And he really had, he took personal responsibility for stepping up and doing what needed to be done next. And he, di he didn't give up. That's a really big point, is that he felt empowered enough to keep moving no matter what. And that's a huge shift. Because if Jim's not involved, if he's not connected, if he's not engaged, the rest of us might as well just go home. So that's a really important piece. So there's another piece that I want you to think about that I think is important if you're a policymaker, but also for you guys, something to think about in terms of the community that we have. We, there's a question on here is like, what has to happen in your community for this to become a reality? And we can, you know, we can, we all come from different places. We've got folks here from the Department of Corrections. We've got folks here from schools. We've got folks here from the mental health system. And so it's not something that we can really answer. But the truth is that all of those systems have to be engaged in the conversation as we move forward in order for this system that we have here on this handout, this scenario, to become a reality in our community. Whatever community we're living in, we have to be able to have that collaborative effort from all of these people to come together and create the culture to create the opportunities, to maybe set aside, maybe wade through some of the paperwork requirements, to be able to give professionals some, some leeway and some flexibility, to be able to create stuff and change language so that we have um, recovery plans instead of treatment plans or relapse plans or crisis plans, that we have plans for hope, we have paperwork that reflects how we're feeling and what we're talking about and that we have a consistency from the top to the bottom everybody's mission is the same is that we're here to help people get well we're here to help people reclaim their lives and to step forward and take personal responsibility and our job is just to kind of help them do that so what I'd like to do now is to really kind of look at who recovers from what as I mentioned earlier that everybody is recovering from something, right? Some, some of us is a little bit more obvious than others. But what people with mental illness are recovering from is they're recovering from not only the impact of the illness, but sometimes the impact of the treatment. Uh, especially if you've been in the system a really long time, when treatment was harsh and the, and the methods that were available and the treatment modalities that were available were um, just inhumane in some regards. So a lot of people are still recovering from some of that treatment. Um, they're recovering from the major losses of opportunity. A lot of times mental illness will strike the best and the brightest right as they begin to set out in their adulthood. So there's a huge loss of opportunity. Everybody loses. Everybody's involved in that grief. When you've got a young person who's just embarking on their life and they're cut down with mental illness and everybody has to regroup and reevaluate and try to move past the loss, but we still have to experience the loss. You can't just go, oh, well, that's okay. It's not okay. There's a huge loss. There's a huge human loss there that we have to acknowledge and we have to really develop, um, acknowledge and heal from so that we can then begin to reframe it and find the positive and the good in it. But that's one of the traumas that we have to overcome is the trauma of the impact of the illness not only on our lives but on the lives of our loved ones. A lot of times when we're in the peak of our illness we really burn a lot of bridges with the people around us and the people that are trying to help us the most. So regaining that trust and reestablishing those connections can be really difficult. And I talked a little bit about what happens when uh, people who are in the helping profession are trying to do that on empty batteries. And that can come across as negative professional attitudes. And professionals who've been around a lot of people who don't have hope, sometimes that can bleed over. And they lose hope. They lose hope in their clients. They lose hope in their own ability to help people. And so they need to help recovering from that. Um, the whole devaluing and disempowering system processes that are in place. So the whole system needs help 
to change, to move over to a more positive, hopeful, recovery-oriented process. And that's happening in a lot of places, but you know, anytime there's government involved or big giant processes involved or insurance companies, all those things that help us get well, typically, they can also act as barriers. So it's not just individuals that need to get well, it's the people on the other side of the desk and it's in fact the whole community and in fact the whole system. So no matter where you look, there's somebody that can take a second look at how they're doing stuff. They can take a second look and see, hmm, is this billing code going to support, foster, is this going to foster recovery or does this really get in the way of professionals helping someone get well? So there's a lot of things that we need to look at. Caregivers and clinicians can really uh, get stuck in worn out beliefs and uh, hopelessness and helplessness. But here's the piece that I think is really important, is that um, you don't need to be in control. You can let it go. Because the role I see as the helper is to provide people with an array of tools and maybe some motivation to pick up those tools. But you can't you know, tape the tools to our hands. Right. So it's up to the people with mental illness who want to get well to pick up those tools and use them. But a lot of times we think that we're failures as helpers if the people that we're helping don't pick up the tools right now. But the truth is, is they may be putting these tools away to be used later. And the next time they're cleaning out their garage, they'll be like, oh my god, I didn't even know I had this. So it's really important that we just continue to give people the tools and don't get really stuck in the outcome. We need to do what's right in front of us right now, what's the right thing for this person right now, and not worry about the outcome too much. Because it may go the way we expect, and it may not. So it's OK for you not to be in control. And you think somehow, but I have the degree. That's my job. I have to have the answers. And you don't. We just look to you for some, warning, for some, uh, for some road signs for some uh, directional information, for uh, some suggestions and some opportunities for growth. And it's great when you can provide us with that. It's great when you can provide us with some insights about what's going on and how we can take something and learn from it and maybe help us to, um, to look at it from a different perspective or to change the context of something so that we can see it totally differently. But you don't need to fix it. It's okay if it doesn't get fixed right away. Um, I know that sometimes it's really hard to believe that people can get well. And they may not get well. But here's the thing. I have never gone to the psychiatrist and been like, I'm just here to make my copay, right? <laughs> because the truth is that the people in the helping industry don't see us when we're at our best. So I haven't been to a therapist or a doctor in a oh my god, years. And the last time anybody heard from me, I was leaving a, what could be described as a manic phone call on their, on their message telling them how well I was. So the truth of the matter is, is that people who are in the helping profession don't really see us when we're at our best. So the, how would they know? How would they know that we're doing really well? So sometimes they, they find it hard to believe that their patients get well because they don't see it and they just kind of do the best they can and hope that it all turns out for the best. Um, and then, so what is the role of the clinician? Is to really help the client to make life choices. To help the client build their own recovery plan. To help the client obtain the records and understand them and to learn from them to help the client access information about medicine and side effects and why did we pick this medicine over that medicine and what are we going to do and I just want to say something about medicine I know that it's a really powerful tool in the toolbox and I highly recommend it if it's if it's something that helps you in your toolbox do it but I think that when we look at medicine we have to look at it like all other treatments within the context of our lives right if you have little kids running around, you don't need a medicine that makes you sleep 12 to 14 hours a day. If you have a job running heavy equipment, you don't want a medicine that says do not operate while, do not take while operating heavy equipment, right there on the label. The medicine is to help us give our lives back. So we don't want a medicine that's going to el eliminate or, or limit our lives. 
The point is, we have a life. The point of the medicine is so that we have a better life. The point of the medicine is not just that we're taking medicine to reduce symptoms. We're taking medicine to reduce symptoms, to reclaim our lives. And I think sometimes that gets forgotten. Now, if your symptoms are so big that you have no life, well then, by all means, get a grip on that first. But remember that the purpose of this tool is to reclaim your life. Now, the piece that I think is really powerful is the fact that we get to say no thank you. And I think that's the part that can be really difficult for, for clinical people is when they, they finally, they're like, I have the answer. This is perfect for you. And the client is like, hmm, yeah, no thanks. And we get to say no thank you. And we get to experience the consequences of that, good and bad. And so it's just, again, it's not, you have to really let go of the outcome and just be able to give people an opportunity to reclaim their power by saying yes please or no thank you and providing them with an array of tools and choices so that they can move forward in that. I think when it comes to families and supporters, it's really important that we stay away from defining our loved ones by their illness and just like everything they do is somehow a pathology. Well, you know how she is, right? So that really she's just mad as hell because she should be, but somehow it gets blamed on the illness. So we really want to stay away from pathologizing a person's feelings or emotions. And we really want to try to engage some hope-inspiring um, strategies and really to validate the person's strengths and weaknesses. So one of the things I say to parents is to um, stop remodeling your basement, right? <laughs> Please. Because when you do that, what you're telling your child is that you don't believe they will ever live independently. That you have no hope for their future. That the best they can hope for is a little uh, cottage or a little uh, you know, apartment in your basement uh, where you overwatch and oversee all of their lives and uh, manage their money and pay all. And, you know, and that's really, sometimes that may be necessary, but if that's the message that you get, that is really depressing. So to be able to live independently in the community, to go to movies with your friends, to be able to go out and have fun with people or to go to work, those are things that everybody can do to some degree or another. And we have to give them the message that we believe it can happen. And, and, and if we're giving them a message that we believe they're incompetent and we need to take care of them until the day we die, that's a really sad thing for them to internalize. And we may not mean it that way, but that's sometimes how it happens. So we really have to encourage and develop maintenance of social relationships away from us, right? Uh, like, go make friends somewhere else and, and let go. And then I've talked a little bit about the role of the community and, and I just can't get, I can't emphasize this more. And, and I, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but the truth of the matter is, is that until the entire community gets involved, there will always be barriers to people's individual efforts. If we don't get safe communities, if we don't have housing opportunities, if we don't have educational opportunities, if we don't have employment opportunities, if we don't have opportunities for people, if the only thing they can do is just, you know, reduce their symptoms, well, that's kind of a limited future. And so that requires collaboration from policymakers. And here's the thing. What we know about policymakers is right now there's a case manager somewhere that is soon going to be an executive director of a nonprofit, maybe in the next, sometime in the next 10 years. So it's all about relationships. If we can begin to create relationships, I don't care if it's New York City or if it's, um, you know, Washougal, mm -hmm. right? It's about relationships. It's about people coming together, having lunch, having a conversation about the way that they can share resources, a way that they can come together and say, look, my agency provides employment services, your agency provides housing, we have a lot of clients in common, maybe we should have some staff in common. <coughs> or maybe we should actually share 
office space or whatever unique opportunity your community has to come together. In this economic time, there's so many empty houses sitting around being foreclosed. I just don't understand why banks aren't working with homeless shelters to try to you know, create some occupancy. And maybe that's just me being naive because I don't really know how either system works. But it just makes sense to me when I see empty houses and homeless families. It's like, what, am I missing something? So I think that relationships can begin that conversation and can begin to tear down some of those barriers and can begin to build some of those bridges. So sustainable change in any system requires community involvement. This is not a mental health system issue. This is a public health system. This is a community issue. And when we can provide support to people emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically, we have a healthier community for all of us. And a healthier community fosters recovery. So it's just this big cycle of life. But it starts and ends with the individual who's experiencing the distress. We have to continue to strive for recovery and believe it can happen. We have to find things that we do well and continually believe in ourselves. And the hardest thing of all is we have to continue to take risks and we have to make a commitment to keep going no matter what whoever it was that said that, right? No matter what happens, no matter how bad things get, we have to keep moving forward and make a commitment to ourselves that we're deserving, that we're worth it. I'm worth more than Jerry Springer, damn it. Right? I deserve to have the best life I can possibly have. And I have to believe that I'm the expert in my own recovery. And you guys are just like there, and I'm so grateful, but I'm the final expert, and I get the final say. And I don't believe that any of it's possible without some kind of a powerful spiritual connection that each person has. And, and that doesn't have to be in the form of any religious doctrine or dogma. And in fact, typically it's outside of that. But some kind of a spiritual connection where we can come to believe and own our own value as spiritual beings and as humans in this experience. And we can find some purpose and some meanings for this. That's what really supports our spirit and supports our energy. What I want to do now is I really would like you to read the handouts um, 17 and 18, number 17 and number 18. And one is uh, targeted for people who experience psychiatric distress, and one is targeted for people who are in the helping professions. And what I want you to do is I want you to, it's two lists, it's like a list of things. Um, and what I would really like to know is which one of these things kind of helps, kind of, kind of just really punches you in the gut when you read it. As a person who's experiencing these things and I'm challenging you and which one of these statements kind of scares you the most and why? And I, and I know I'm, I'm kind of asking you to be a little vulnerable here in front of the group and we've been together all day so I'm hoping that you won't mind doing that. Um. The last one here says, what are the things that might get in the way of both of us stretching and growing? And um, I tend to think of myself as, you know, the one that's well, helping the one that's sick. Yes. And so when it says both of us stretching and growing, that puts responsibility on me to not think of myself as more well than the person that I'm helping. It's, we're, it's a collaborative effort, and I, I like how that's phrased. So even though you're in the helping role, you realize that you do need to stretch and grow and put yourself in a vulnerable situation and take some risks mm -hmm. in order to be collaborative in that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Thank you. I was uh, struck by number three, am I willing to take risks that aren't calculated by someone else? Mm. It seems to me I'm often defined in my problems, both uh, in terms of people having expectations far lower than mine and people having expectations far greater than mine. And so I have to essentially establish my own sense of what I need to, to how I need to risk and what I need to risk at a particular moment. And this is something that over the year and a half that I've been treated mm -hmm. that uh, has become very evident to me. And that I, I can't be limited either way by, by what a clinician or a a bureaucrat might be saying that I should be or should not be doing. So you um, try not to limit yourself by the expectations either above or high expectations <laughs> or low expectations of anybody around you. 
That's right. You set your own. You take. You 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 set I'm, your own course, and you assume responsibility for your own recovery. That's right. As if I'm defiant. She's <laughs> defiant that way. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the word I would use, but I would use it. Empowered is the word I would use. Well, often it's, I get uh, essentially both frustrated and angry, and so the oh the, yeah. The, the, Defiance comes from yes. emotions. Yes, when you get frustrated and angry and that comes across in your communication style, people do tend to label you defiant. <laughs> that's one of the consequences be, that, of that's that. That's about the only time they're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nancy. How can I put aside assumptions and predictions in a way that encourages the other person to do the same? My first reaction to that is there's a lot of power in that statement. It, it, it's telling the consumer that they do have the power to yeah. influence something in that reciprocal way. The other part is that it, um, it's a lot harder to, to respond in a way that, that causes the other person to grow than it is to just blast out with something that, that you find offensive or, or pejorative. and, and this one says, yeah, we really do have the ability to influence each other, and it's how we say, how we speak, not what we say. So it isn't just the part of the clinician monitoring how they speak, but, it's the, but also the client teaching the, the clinician and, and, and passing that knowledge back and forth, and each one recognizing their own authority and power. And, and it seems to me that by doing that, you're validating yeah, and building yeah. each other's power and, and authority yeah. and, and accuracy. So the next time somebody comes in, you can be like, ooh, I've seen this before. Yeah, nice. Any others? OK. So we're going to go through this now. Do you know more about the origins of recovery and the definitions of recovery than you did in the beginning? Do you guys believe that recovery is possible? Absolutely. What? Yes. <laughs> and you understand what it is? Yes. And we've gone through all 11 components? Yes. yes. And you've identified who recovers from what? Yes. Right? You've got a little better understanding of that? And you, everybody knows their role in recovery now? Yes. All right. Go forth and prosper. But before you do, I need you to fill out your evaluations. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming and participating in this workshop today.